Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody. And uh, this is a webinar that is focused on pediatric neurosurgery coding. And we are fortunate enough to have Dr. Lance Governelli and Dr. Kathy Mazzola, who are both well known within uh, pediatric neurosurgery and have given this course for the AB, uh, AANS before and are experts in the ins and outs of a very complicated system. So without any further ado, Lance, would you please uh, let us out and we'll finish the, their two talks with some specific case examples. Again, Lance, take it away. Sounds good. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, the topic is the exciting pediatric neurosurgery procedure coding, and I'm at the University of Florida in Gainesville. I have no disclosures. So first, a moment. Why are we doing this? And, um, you know, initially, it, in my mind, it was like, of course, we're going to do this. But there, there were questions about why we're, we're doing this. So, you know, the bottom line is correct coding is expected. You know, it's not um, how do you, you know, how do you take out this tumor? Should you take out this tumor? But it is an aspect of pediatric neurosurgical practice. So from a medical legal perspective, code, correct coding is important. You know, the, whether you have billers and coders or not, the attending surgeon is the one that is ultimately responsible for the code selected. So you have to be accurate from that perspective. Um, it has now been proven important in board certification too. We're talking oral board certification. So people are failing their oral boards partly because of coding problems. Now, for people who haven't logged cases in the case system yet, it asks you what code you build. And there have been cases specifically picked for discussion just for coding and um, it, it has become a problem. So that is another reason why this is important tonight. And then, you know, finances are important. So, you know, if, if the finances are not secured in an institution, the service mission cannot occur. So all the things we want to do, we can't do if the finances are not appropriate and they're only appropriate if we code correctly. So our agenda tonight, um, we've split it up. I'm gonna talk about the global period, modifiers, hydrocephalus and craniosynostosis. anastosis. Then Kathy's gonna pick up with tumor spine, spasticity, and epilepsy, um, probably more of the former uh, than the latter. Oh, so key references. So there are, um, there's not necessarily a reason to memorize every code. The point is to get a sense of how coding works and then know where to look if you need to look. So two key references. Um, the one on the right is the, the big manual. The AMA releases a CPT coding book each year. Um, doesn't necessarily change much from year to year, but it's nice to have at least one recent copy. And everything is in there for every specialty. The book on the left is a book um, made by the double ANS and the coding group within the double ANS, specific for neurosurgical coding and has tidbits and interpretations more specific to our specialty. So they're good references to have around when the question comes up and you're trying to think about which code might be the right one or can I build this, can I not build that? And hopefully this presentation and slides will be helpful for you also in the future. Okay, so um, first the exciting global surgical package. So what does this mean? So any procedure is defined to have a certain amount of preoperative work and postoperative work associated with it. Um, it's important to know about this because different codes have different lengths of codes. Um, most have 90 day lengths, but some can have zero or 10 day lengths. And so it's important to know which ones have which. Um, and it's also important to know what is included in the global code and what is not, because if it's not, that means it's separately billable and you can add that on and get credit for extra work that you might do. So as I mentioned, it includes intra-op and post-op work, but it also includes the routine, if there is a routine pre-op visit, now not the clinic visit where you're talking with them and should we do surgery, should we not? But the global starts after that visit where the decision for surgery is made. So if there's a pre-op visit to your office where um, somebody's listening to heart and lungs, routine pre-op stuff, that visit, if um, done by somebody in your office is included in the global period. Um, so like I said, there's uh, most codes have a 90 day global period associated with them but some have zero and 10. So taps and drains tend to have a zero day global period associated with them. So there are certain times where it might make sense if you have a choice to pick a code with a, uh, a zero day global. For example, when you insert an amyo or ventricular access device, 
and you know that there's going to be, let's say you put a VAD in a NICU kid, and you know that there's going to be a lot of ENM work after that, not necessarily fully associated with the surgery itself. <laughs> nice to use a code that has a zero day global. Well, if you use 61210, which is the burr hole for insertion of device code, instead of the 61215, 61210 doesn't have a, has a zero day global. So you can continue to bill for the ENM that goes on after that and get credit for it. Um, similar with uh, ventricular subgalial shunts, VSGS, if those are coded as 61210 instead of 62223, which is insertion of a new shunt, then again, they'll have a zero day global and you can count all that extra work you're doing afterwards and make you continuing to watch these kids. And then once you, if you place the initial shunt, then when you do the definitive hydrocephalus procedure, yes, there'll be a 90 day global associated with that. So what is included in the global period? <clears throat> So in the global period includes positioning, pin, skin prep, local, the usual opening, hemostasis, nerve stimulation, uh, except the exception here is that there are certain dedicated approach codes. There's a set of skull based codes, which are uh, honestly not used as much these days than when people were drilling out the skull base for a lot of different things to approach a tumor. That, that has a dedicated approach code, but that's a, a small exception here. Um, neuromonitoring is also included in the global. So the neurosurgeon can't bill for SSAP, MEP, EMG, EEG, but the provider, sometimes neurologist, whoever it is reading it, they can bill for providing the service, but the neurosurgeon can't bill for using it. Uh, similar for intra-op scanning, the neurosurgeon uh, can't bill just for that. Like if you're using fluoro, you can't add a fluoro code. Uh, resection aids, laser, ultrasound, uh, the, the ultrasonic aspirator, and loops. That's all included in the global period. So none of this is separately billable for the neurosurgeon. Uh, continuing on, on the, the closure end of things. So duraplasty is included, except if there's a delayed repair on a different date of service. So in other words, for fixing a CSF leak, or you had to close up quickly without doing the duroplasty and you came back in later and you have to close the dura, that type of thing. Um, and then some spine fractures, there's a, uh, a separate duroplasty, dura repair code for that as well. Um, cranioplasty is included in the global. So obviously putting the patient's bone flap back on would be part of the actual procedure. Even if you put some you, you know, hydroxyapatite cement in the groove, that's still counted as part of the global. However, if there's bone loss, like the, the bones, you're getting rid of the bone for infection or trauma, there's too many small pieces or it's invaded with tumor and you have to do a cranioplasty because of that, that is separately billable. Uh, irrigation, closures, drains, uh, wound closure, dressing, removal of pins, all this is included in the global as, as you might expect. Okay, so what's excluded from the global? So a ventricular or a lumbar drain outside of the incision for surgery itself, that's different and that's separately billable and codable. Uh, traction or halo application, if for continued use post-op and not just for intra-op use is separate. A complicated wound closure with a flap or a graft, even an advancement flap, which sometimes is necessary for, for things we do is separately codable. Um, additional surgeries or procedures post-op. So just because you're in a 90 day global from a certain surgery, that doesn't that, that includes the ENM post-op but not other surgeries and procedures you may do. You can still bill and code for that. Um, also listed as critical care e &M services unrelated to the surgery. I, I don't think um, that applies much to neurosurgery these days. And I um, honestly, CMS have been clamping down on that more. So um, the critical care docs are probably billing for that and they can continue to bill for that. But as far as the neurosurgeon billing for that, that that's a little iffy these days. Uh, use of the microscope is excluded from the global. So the, the code is 699 and zero, it's a common code you'll see. Um, and it's microscope only, so it's not endoscope. So far, it's still not exoscope and it's not loops, as I mentioned before. There are some codes where the microscope is bundled because it always requires it, um, which is annoying, but it's just the way it is. Uh, so ACD, ACDF, ACD with uh, disc arthroplasty can't have the microscope code as an extra. Uh, anterior thoracic disc, peripheral neurolysis, sympathectomy, transphenol are all expected that the microscope is going to be used, so you can't have it with it. Um, private, pay private payers may still reimburse for spine. Um, again, iffy, so it depends on 
your patient mix and your payer mix, whether it's worth trying, um, and you have to get a local sense of that more than uh, can be covered in a talk like this. Um, if navigation is being used also, we have to put a 59 modifier on it, and we'll talk about modifiers in a minute. So navigation is excluded from the global. So stereotactic computer assisted, if there's a head frame application that's included, obviously we don't do much of that anymore these days. Uh, the, the main codes are um, cranial intradural, which is the most you're gonna use for your brain lab and your stealth, 61781, you'll see that a lot. Um, similar to the microscope, some codes just include it, uh, which is again, annoying. So stereotactic radio surgery, you can't separately bill for it. Um, and if you do a stereotactic burr hole procedure for biopsy, aspiration, catheter, essentially anything where they know it's stereotactic and you need to use something, you can't use the add-on code, which is um, frustrating, but it just is again. Uh, cranial extradural has a separate code and spinal uh, navigation has a separate code, as you see there. And again, SRS in the spine, you can't add that code on either. Also excluded from the global, if you do electrocorticography, you can bill it separately using that code you see there. Uh, laminoplasty um, is, a, is a code sometimes used in pediatric neurosurgery uh, for, for spine and um, sometimes tethering operations, depending on how it goes. Uh, so there's a separate code for that. Uh, there, as most people I think know, there's many different codes for bony fusion for complex spine cases. Uh, if you use an endoscope, if you're one of the people who use an endoscope for ventricular catheter placement, uh, there's an add-on code for that. Uh, graft harvest has a code, and we're talking about from a separate incision. So fat graft fascia muscle, you know, from, from the abdomen, from wherever, and you're using it in the head, you can add that code on. Uh, so that's the global surgical period. We're going to transition into modifiers. Um, and what this section really lets you get a sense of is, what coding is, is essentially translating what you've done into another numerical language that billers and payers and CMS can uh, decipher and figure out what to pay you. And modifiers are an add-on to that language, which kind of flavors the code. It gives them more information uh, about what you've done and, and how, it, how it drives with each other. So <clears throat> uh, the first one is decision for surgery. So um, if you've done an evaluation management code that results in a decision for surgery within 24 hours, yet yeah, the, the uh, 57 modifier has to be used because typically the payers won't pay for two codes in one day. So this tells them why that's being submitted that way. Uh, the 25 ENM is, is a um, ENM that is significant and separately identifiable on the day of surgery by the same physician. Uh, this, tends to be not used much in pediatric neurosurgery. The example that is given is um, a physician seeing somebody for shortness of breath and doing a skin lesion removal at the same time. Well, those are separate things that can be billed separately, but it's rare that this one will be used by pediatric neurosurgery. And thankfully, in the places where you do have billers and coders, they, they tend to be really good with the modifiers. So I, I personally tend to lean on them more for the modifiers, and I think that's appropriate. Um, but you should definitely know the language that is being used, as I mentioned before. So some modifiers for surgery itself. So increased procedural services has its own modifier. So where things are more difficult than usual and significantly so. Um, now, I know a lot of times we think a lot of our surgeries are uh, a, a lot more difficult than they, they often are necessarily, you know, the complex shunt revisions, et cetera. Um, if you use it too much, you might trigger a review by the payer. So um, sometimes you have to think whether you want to use this or not. Again, if you're in, if you're in the one control uh, controlling who's actually, if you're the one controlling who's which modifier is being put on. Um, and the other thing to mention at this point is that a lot of our institutions, you, you know, we're we're tracked by RVU progress and not necessarily dollar progress. So these modifiers may not translate into RVU changes at your particular institution. That's another uh, aside that each institution does differently. Um, so there's a modifier for reduced services you see there, and there's also a discontinued procedure modifier. You know, a patient became unstable, you had to close real fast. Well, you need to let them know you didn't do the whole thing, but you know, you did, you were there and you were putting work towards this patient. 
uh, more surgical modifiers. So bilateral procedure uh, has a modifier, um, multiple procedures and distinct procedural service. The one I mentioned before, like you're taking the graft at a different incision. So why these become important is because in the payer's mind, um, again, like I mentioned before, the CPT code has a global associated with it. And the global is intraoperative and postoperative work. And if you're doing a bilateral procedure, yes, you're doing double of the intraoperative work, but they don't wanna pay you or give you credit for double of the post-op work because that in their mind is the same regardless of if you did it on one side or the other. So that's where these, uh, mod that's what these modifiers are doing. Um, and unfortunately, there's nothing we can do. We have to, you have to accurately list them. Uh, there we go. Okay. So one that is uh, applicable to pediatric neurosurgery a lot is the 63 modifier. So if you're doing a surgery on a patient who weighs less than four kilograms, um, you can put this modifier on it. So um, I say possible increased credit for complexity of work associated with these patients. It's dependent on the payer. Some recognize it, some don't. Again, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about that. And like I mentioned, some institutions will give you RVU credit for that modifier and some won't. And again, nothing you can do. You're just, you're working within their language, unfortunately. And, you know, our, our specialty societies have committees that try to influence that um, and we can only do as much as we can. Um, this um, modifier can't be used for codes where the work is implied. So for myelomeningocele repair, where pretty much they're all gonna be less than four kilos, you can't use the 63 modifier. Surgeon role, um, this one comes up a lot. And this is important to know about because if you're doing a surgery with another surgeon, you have to have that quick discussion are we billing by co-surgeon? Who's going to be in what role? Because if, they, if that's not done right, the payers will kick back both uh, operative reports and uh, it'll create issues or potentially never be billed at all. So uh, 62 modifiers, co-surgeon. So each surgeon is doing a distinct portion of the procedure. Each provides an operative note and each receives 62.5% of the, the total credit. So um, this, you know, uh, you do a surgery with ENT or you do a surgery with plastics. Sometimes there are separate codes and you don't have to do this. You know, your plastics has their own codes, neurosurgery has their codes, but sometimes there are joint codes. And if you're co-surgeon, this is how it works. So it's 125% um, it's for the institution, but only 62.5% for the in individual surgeon. Um, assistant surgeons has two codes, so 80 and 82. Uh, 80 is for a place that doesn't have residence and 82 is for a place that does have residence, but no qualified resident is available, which is a, a, a buzzword that needs to go in the operative report. Um, the assistant surgeon gets 16% of the total. The primary surgeon still gets 100%. So no decrease in the primary surgeon there just because there was an assistant. Um, and then the assistant code, if it's a PA and PRN is AS, and that's a 10.4% uh, with the primary surgeon not getting any decrease in there percentage. Uh, a couple others related to the global period. Um, this is a little bit of minutia, but 58 stage procedure by same provider. Um, so plan prospectively or more extensive than the original or following up uh, therapy following a diagnostic procedure. So you do an LP and then you externalize a shunt or you try an ETV, it doesn't work, you place a shunt. Uh, that's the type of thing going on there. And again, it's to let so let them know that um, this is not because somebody did something wrong and needs to get flagged or, hey, we're not gonna pay for your complication type of thing. Um, that you're, you're speaking the numerical language to the, to the payers. Uh, 78 is an unplanned return to the OR related procedure by same provider. And then you have this unrelated procedure by same provider, repeat procedure by same provider, repeat procedure by different provider. So um, again, the code that's used to talk with them. I haven't seen these necessarily been kicked out for the, the lower half of the slide here, but they have to know what's going on. Okay, well, uh, that's the end of the modifier section. We're gonna have time at the end for questions about all this. And again, this will serve as a reference. Uh, we're gonna transition to hydrocephalus coding. Um, so for shunt insertion, um, which obviously we do a lot. So these are the codes for it. Your typical code is gonna be a 62223. Um, that covers ventricular peritoneal, ventricular pleural, and other. So 
That's why I said 6223 can be used for VSGS if you want, because the subgalial terminus is counted as other in coding language. But again, I think it's more advantageous to use 61210. Uh, ventriculoatrial has its own because of the extra work there to, to get the atrial catheter in, so 62220. Um, subdural to peritoneal, subdural atrial has its own separate codes. We do it sometimes, but not a lot. I mentioned the 61210 for VSGS and VAD. Uh, so the add-ons potential here, navigation, remember, has the add-on cranial intradural, and then the endoscope assist, uh, which I think is pretty rare for most of us, but it has its own code because a lot of these codes have been around for a long time, and then uh, they become difficult to change. So there are codes for things we, we rarely do anymore. But there are times when we'll use an endoscope. Shunt revision, everybody's favorite. So um, separate set of codes. So 62225 is if you change the ventricular catheter. Subdural has a corollary code. Um, if you change the valve or distal catheter, 62230. So um, if you're just changing the valve, that code applies. You don't, you don't also have to change the distal catheter. However, if you change the valve and the distal, it's still just that code. If you change the valve and the ventricular catheter, you can put both 2230 and 2225 uh, on, your, on your billing, and that's, that's uh, legitimate. Um, 62230 includes externalizing a shunt at the clavicle. Um, these same codes, obviously most of this happens in the operating room, but these same codes apply at the bedside if there happens to be a case where the shunt's being externalized at the clavicle. Don't forget that if, the, if you're at a place with residents and the residents are doing it, um, if you're present and supervising the procedure, you can still put the code through, but make sure you don't do that if you're not present and supervising the procedure or, or that will be flagged eventually. Um, 62256 is shunt removal without replacement. 62258 is shunt removal with replacement. So it includes replacement with an EVD. So if you're taking out an infected shunt and placing an EVD, it's the 2258 code uh, that counts there. And again, the navigation and endoscope assist codes could be appended to these if, if applicable. Uh, spinal shunt happens, but obviously more rare, uh, has its own set of codes. Two insertion codes with or without laminectomy. I, I think most people do it without. Um, revision or replacement has its own code with less specificity in terms of which part you're revising. Uh, removal has its own code. And then the spinal navigation add-on is a potential if, if it suits the particular case, but obviously that would be rare. Uh, I alluded to this, so bedside procedures. Um, these things can be coded for and have separate codes. And again, if you're supervising, make sure you're present and supervising, you put a note saying that. Uh, so EVD, ICP monitor, or Maya VAD, VHDS, these type of things, if they're placed via a twist drill hole, so, you know, for, the, for example, the egg beater drill in the CSF access kit that has 61107 code to it, if it's via a burr hole, it's the 61210, like I talked about. Um, it, obviously, at bedside, it mostly will be twist drill hole, typically. Uh, lumbar puncture has its own code, 62270. Lumbar drain is 62272. If you look in the books, it'll say 70 is diagnostic lumbar puncture and 72 is therapeutic lumbar puncture. And while that's true, the lumbar drain falls under the uh, 72 therapeutic lumbar puncture code. Uh, shunt tap has its own code, 61070. Um, shunt reprogram, this is a common thing uh, we'll use. And again, even if it's the somebody else doing it, if you're there and supervising, you can use this code, uh, you can bill for what you supervise them doing, um, 62252. And it's worth you know, putting through every one of these that you can that, that you're doing the work for. You should get credit for the work you do. Um, Transfontanel ventricular tap has a code, 61020. Um, subdural tap through the fontanel actually has an initial and a subsequent code that you see there. Um, they're very similar, but they decided in, historically to have a code for each. Uh, endoscopy. So the, the, the main things we'll do endoscopically with hydrocephalus are on this slide. So ETB is 62201. That's a code we use commonly. It'll probably stick in your head eventually. Um, CPC. So doesn't have its own dedicated code. So the way to, the standard way to put it through is 64999, which is the unlisted neurosurgery code. And then 
you have to provide a fee comparison code and tell them what the similar procedure is. So um, it has been deemed that 615 amongst our, our specialty, that 61544, which is the open cord plexus code is the best fee comparison code we have. So that's what we use for CPC. So if you do both, again, ETV CPC, it's 62201 and 64999 with 61544 fee comparison code. This is where referring back to these slides can be helpful because a lot of numbers. Um, septostomy, so endoscopic septostomy or fenestration of arachnoid cyst or fenestration of loculations has its own code 62161. Uh, colloid cyst fenestration removal 62162. Foreign body removal 62163. And tumor resection 62164. Um, the navigation code can be added on to these. There are times where it's not something you're doing maybe outside of the range of what the code specifically says and you have to make a judgment call. For example, let's say you're doing endoscopic removal of um, infection, infective material. You know, is that a washout? Is that liquid? Are you fenestrating inoculations? It can be hard sometimes to figure out what to use. Um, in the, in the rare instance where I've, I've done things like this, um, I classified it as a foreign body removal because infection is, is foreign material. There was one time where the infection was so inspissated and essentially like a ball, I'd said, this is, and I'm dissecting it off the appendema, this is kind of like a tumor resection. So I've used that and I haven't had a kick back at me. And sometimes you just have to use your judgment for the weird things which, which come along sometimes with the guidance of your biller or coder if you have it. Okay, transitioning to craniosynostosis. So there's um, a lot of variation from center to center in terms of how craniosynostosis is built. And in fact, there have been studies of different centers about how they build things. And it's one of the, it's one of the diagnoses, which is all over the map. Um, some of the more common things that are, are more uniform from center to center. So uh, 61550 strip craniectomy, single suture. So the, um, yes, it can be open, but these days it's more the endoscopic strip craniectomy where you're gonna be putting a helmet on or you do a spring assist afterwards, that's your code there for that. Um, 61552 is strip craniectomy, multiple sutures. So although let's say you're doing bilateral coronal endoscopic, although it's double the work and you could argue for 61550 within the bilateral modifier, um, there is a separate code for it. Um, and, it's nice to have agreements in place already with the payers as far as how these things are going to go through, but that, that's often difficult. So there's a little variability there. And I think either would be legitimate, but there's variability there. Um, 61557 is bifrontal craniotomy and 21175 is frontal orbital advancement. So the anterior crani open craniosynostosis procedures, this tends to be the code pair that's used. Um, if you're doing it with your plastic surgeon, you have to discuss how you want to use these. Uh, oftentimes, the neurosurgeon will bill 61557, uh, and the plastic surgeon will bill for the frontal orbital advancement. And then if you're assisting the other person with the other procedure, you can bill the assist. You can bill the code with an assist modifier as well. So the neurosurgeon can also bill 21175-82 if they've helped with the frontal orbital advancement as well. That's, that's legitimate. The 61559 extensive craniectomy recontouring tends to be the code used for the posterior craniosynostosis cases, um, sometimes with some of the others, but th that covers a lot of the posterior procedures. Um, then the last three, so if you're doing a strip craniectomy and implanting uh, springs after you've done the craniectomy, that has, that's the code used is there, 20690. It's kind of a universal code for uniplanar implant. Uh, it's more in the plastic set of codes, but it's the appropriate code for this procedure. Um, you can build two instances of it if you put two springs in. Uh, 20692 is distractor placement. So sometimes we'll do these um, cranial distraction cases where you're slowly separating the bone edge and with the little screw device that you implant. Implanting that device is using that code. And again, if you implant two, you can put two instances of that code through. And then spring distractor removal uh, is 20680. 
All right, that's my portion. Thank you very much for your time. We'll be uh, answering questions at the end. I'm gonna pitch it right over to Kathy. Kathy, you're on mute. There we go. I'm off mute now, so that should be better. But why can't I go backwards? Hang on. All right, and just have to see me if I can go. <clears throat> All right, so do you guys hear me now? Yes. All right, fine. So no disclosures. Every child has a story. We'll go through some surgeries and the codes that I chose for those children. And uh, at the end, we can go over some questions you guys, if you guys have about different uh, coding scenarios. So we can start uh, with the first child, Alex. So you see a child in the office, he has a severe cerebral palsy, he has severe scoliosis, but you know children with a severe cerebral palsy also have multiple comorbidities. This is where it's important for you in your E&M note, your evaluation and management note, to document their comorbidities, the things that you have to deal with as a neurosurgeon the patient's severely cachectic, the patient has a G-tube, they have a tracheostomy, all of that should be documented in your initial consultation. And obviously, the more documentation you have, the more complex the case is. So if you're going to build a high complexity consultation, make sure that it's actually documented in your e &M consultation. And then for a child, if you're doing a dorsal rhizotomy or something like that, if you're uh, doing a laminectomy with rhizotomy, usually you're doing more than one segment. So there are different codes for laminectomy with rhizotomy, one or two segments or more than two, more than two segments. And then if it's a very complicated case, for example, the child has severe scoliosis, they have multiple comorbidities, the child's going to be in the hospital for a long time. You know this is going to be an extended post-op course. It's okay to use the modifier 22 because that indicates the extra work that's going into the case. The operating microscope is a separate CPT code. And the CPT code is common procedural terminology code. And this is what the insurance companies understand. They don't necessarily understand what a rhizotomy is, but they know what you're talking about when you bill that five digit code. If you do multiple laminectomies, that's included in the code. But if you do an osteoplastic recon reconstruction of the dorsal elements of the spine, that means you put the lamina back in position and you secure them. In a younger child, you can do you can secure the bone or the lamina in position with heavy gauge suture, and that code is still applicable. In an older child, you might be using, you know, a microplates or a craniofacial plating system or a laminar plating system. But all of those codes should only be linked to the spastic quadriplegic or spastic diplegic CP. When you build that code, you don't want to add in all the comorbidity codes there. Because if in the, within the global period, a child has a shunt malfunction and you linked in the hydrocephalus, it falls into your global period. So you only link the CPT code to the relevant diagnosis for that procedure. 
believe it or not, osteoplastic reconstruction of the dorsal elements of the spine can be billed separately for all the procedures listed here. So, you know, um, Lance mentioned one of the AMA books. He also mentioned the AANS book for coding. Uh, there's another company that publishes coding and uh, reimbursement books. That company is called Optum. I have no association with Optum. They used to be called Ingenix. And what's nice about the books is for every single code, for example, for 63295, they have a separate page and they will tell you what other procedures that code can be listed with and what diagnoses it will be acceptable for. So if you have a question, look it up in the book for sure. Now, obviously, if you see the patient in your office after surgery within the global, you have to bill a post-op visit, which has no relative value unit, no RVU associated with it, and there is no charge associated with it. However, let's say this patient goes to inpatient rehab and he's sent back to your hospital with abdominal pain, severe constipation, possibly withdrawal. That's a new diagnosis. If you're asked to see your patient who's admitted with abdominal pain to try to figure out why he apparently has abdominal pain, they're consulting you for a new problem and you are allowed to bill for that consultation. You also bill for inpatient rounds. So if you see a patient, let's say for pseudotumor cerebri and you're working the patient up with the neurologist, you do your hospital consultation, there are different codes whether you see the patient in the emergency room or after the patient's been admitted to the floor. So those are two separate different e &M codes. Now let's say the patient's there hospital day two. If you spend more than 35 minutes with that patient, whether it's reviewing films, discussing the patient with other hospital doctors, consultants, going down to radiology, talking to the family, making plans. Anything over 35 minutes, it's 99233. When you round and everything that you do is less than 35 minutes or the patient's very stable, it's 99232. Less than 15 minutes, 99231. And those are important codes to bill, especially for non operative hospital patients. Here's an example of a bad head trauma. So Sophia was a little girl who came in after a fifth grade bus. They were on a, a school trip, rolled over. So we actually initially saw her in the trauma bay. And the decision for surgery was made in the emergency room. So you don't bill it as an inpatient consultation because she was technically in the emergency room in the trauma bay. You spend time talking to trauma, the patient gets stabilized, you take her to the OR. So you bill for your initial ER trauma bay consult, and then you would bill for craniotomy for evacuation of supratentorial hematoma, whether it's an epidural or a subdural, it doesn't really matter. Now, let's say you make the decision, you're gonna leave the bone off and you decide that you're gonna put the bone subcutaneously in the abdomen. 61316 is placement of cranial bone graft into the belly and you add the 59 modifier to show that it's in a different and separate location. Then if you decide on the opposite side, you're going to put a ventricular catheter, you would bill 61210. You add the right-sided modifier. And again, you're telling the coders, this was a separate incision. I didn't do this through the left side. 
So that's the code for that. Now let's say three weeks later, everything is going well, you decide to put the bone flap back into position. Then you can build 62143, add a 58 modifier, which shows that you took the patient back to the operating room, not because of a complication, but in a staged procedure. So yes, I left the bone off, and in a staged procedure, a few weeks later, a few days later, I'm taking her to put the bone flap back. There's also a separate code you would bill, 61316, to take the bone out of the abdomen, out of the pocket where you have it. So it's a separate incision, and it, again, is a staged procedure. One of the things that I didn't bill for, because I didn't think it was appropriate, when she initially came in, she did have a comminuted uh, fracture. So I actually plated it, plated the fracture before I put it into the abdomen. And what I thought was interesting, three weeks later, taking the bone flap out, the amount of healing and granulation tissue that had grown into the fractured area was really pretty significant, but I did not bill for that. So she did well, we still see her, but she's totally fine. This was another child who came in the same day with the bus accident. Again, you're billing for the ER consult, the trauma bay consult, decision for surgery, craniotomy for evacuation of hematoma on the left. We did not bill for a post-op rounds in the PICU. He went to rehab. And then a few months later, again, he had a cranioplasty with autograft, uh, and that was a staged procedure. So you have to uh, basically tell the insurance companies when you're taking them back as a stage procedure. So modifier 58 is your stage procedure. You basically have to document that this was plans and not a complication. Theoretically, you should expect reimbursement in 100%, and it resets the global period from the first surgery to the second surgery. So the second surgery would start the 90-day global. A 59 modifier is different. It's used to identify procedures that are not normally reported together that are appropriate under the circumstances. You have to document that this was a separate procedure done at a separate site or on a separate organ system through a separate incision, and it's very important. When you, dot, when you dictate operative notes, you have to get into the habit of dictating very good and thorough operative notes. For example, the first paragraph really should be uh, dedicated to talking about the patient, talking about how you got or obtained an informed consent and what information you gave to the parent or the guardian at the time of the surgery and, you know, basically, you know, if there are witnesses there, you can say, I did an informed consent. I explained to the mother and father the risks and benefits of the surgery, including A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, I answered all of their questions. They uh, appeared to understand everything. If you used a translator, it's important to document that. And then, then in the second and third paragraph, you usually should dictate how the procedure and how the operating room was set up, that a timeout was done, IV antibiotics were or were not given, steroids were or were not given, and then you dictate the procedure. The procedure, again, for every single procedure you are billing for, for example, if you are billing for evacuation of subdural, you dictate that part of the surgery. And then let's say you're billing for a ventricular drain. That has to be a separate paragraph. You have to explain where the ventricular drain went in, how the drain was put in, were there, you know, what was the result, you know, the, the drain was secured to the head, whatever. So that, and if you did it on an opposite side, all of that should be dictated in the procedure. And then, of course, your last, you know, your last few paragraphs should be closing, and where the patient went after the surgery. 
So this was a child, believe it or not, we were called by trauma because the child fell off a changing table. So he was seen in the PEDS ICU. He was admitted by trauma. He had a CT scan of the head. Obviously this is not trauma, this was a brain tumor. So he had an MRI, he was taken to, for surgery. So notice with the first consultation, there was no modifier 57 because that was just the consultation. We did not take the patient to the operating room the first day. Otherwise we would have had to use a 57 modifier. But two days after admission, he went to the operating room. He had a craniotomy for supratentorial tumor. He had stereotactic neuro navigation, cranial, intradural, operating microscope. We did not use modifiers for stereotactic neuro navigation and the operating microscope. And there are some payers who will try to tell you operating microscope is bundled in to all of our surgeries. It is technically not. Microsurgery using loops is bundled into our surgeries, but not an operating microscope because that's a separate setup. So two weeks later, he's still doing okay. However, he needed a subdural to peritoneal shunt. Now, if you're doing a procedure and you feel that this is not a complication of your surgery, but it's related to a different diagnosis, you can use a 79 modifier, which tells the insurance companies, this is technically an unrelated procedure, but it's not a post-operative complication. So it's related to something else, but not uh, a complication from surgery. The next slide or a few slides, I have to thank Andrew J for it. And I spoke to him and he said I could use these slides. So Andrew actually uh, gave a talk. I think it was for the Council of State Neurosurgical uh, Societies where we end PEDS section where we went over some spine billing. So this was a 17-year-old child, C5 flexion distraction injury. He was a C4 Asia A patient, quadriplegic, taken to the operating room for decompression and stabilization of the spinal column. So the two main diagnoses here are fracture of C5, unstable flexion distraction injury, and C4 Asia A quadriplegia. So he had an anterior procedure which was done first. He had a C5 corpectomy for compression of the spinal cord, placement of a C5 peak cage for interbody fusion. He had harvest of local autograph from the C5 vertebral body, placement of anterior plate, intraop fluoroscopy, placement of Mayfield head holder with traction. Now, one of the things that Lance mentioned is billing for fluoroscopy and head holder application, okay? This is a very controversial area. Most insurance companies, I can tell you, consider those codes to be bundled into the primary codes. There are very few payers who will pay for it because they feel that all of the 7,000 CPT codes belong to radiology and many of the 2000 codes don't get paid to neurosurgeons. For the posterior stabilization, intraoperolateral cervical spine, again, very often you're not gonna get paid on any of the 7,000 codes. The C4 to C6 posterior instrumented fusion uh, with lateral mass screws, those are billed separately. C4 to 6 laminectomy for decompression, it's a 63045 code for C4 and 63048 for C5 and C6. And I would add 51 modifiers to those because they're second codes. And then the arthrodesis codes. And those are the codes that uh, Andrew would have used for those. So one of the, the confusions, I think, when it, some of the confusion in regard to uh, coding and billing, there are no actual federal and state laws, but many insurance companies, for example, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Aetna, they will follow CMS 
rules and regulations. So CMS stands for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Medicare is administered by our federal government, whereas Medicaid is federally subsidized, but administered by the state. So although the reimbursement for Medicare across the country is standardized, Medicaid reimbursement varies state by state. In some states, Medicaid reimbursement is par or identical to Medi Medicare and Medicaid or par. However, in some states where there are a significant uh, population of patients who have Medicaid, in those states, Medicaid reimbursement can be as low as one tenth or one twentieth of Medicare. So you should know the difference between Medicare, Medicaid, and private payer insurance companies. Now, what happens in many in instances is that you can submit your operative report, you can submit your bills to the insurance companies. And what happens in many cases is that the insurance company will pay on the primary or the first code and they deny all the other codes. So that if you have a, a competent billing department, then those billers will come back to you as a neurosurgeon and say, these were the codes that were rejected for this surgery. So can you document or do you have documentation that supports these codes? So as I said, if you have an operative report that has documentation which supports the second and the third code, if you have a documentation, a paragraph explaining for the remainder of the surgery, uh, I use the intraoperative microscope. The intraoperative microscope was necessary because this was delicate brain surgery. I mean, even two sentences will help you get reimbursed sometimes for a second or a third code. Many states like New Jersey have rules about out of network and surprise billing. Um, and this balance billing is a very broad term. And it's, in my opinion, it's used too often because there are some balances that you technically have to bill for. So for example, if you bill for a surgery, for example, you bill for a brain tumor resection with microscope and neuronavigation, sometimes those charges based on your state can be quite high. And if the parents or if the person has an insurance like Aetna or Blue Cross Blue Shield, and they say the patient has a $5,000 deductible, that means the parents are responsible for the first 5,000. And then they may say the parents have a 20% co-insurance or 20% co-payment, which means the insurance company pays 80 and the parents pay 20%. So what happens very often is that, you know, and uh, I, I can tell you because I have family members when they their employer offers them insurance, very often people are offered a PPO plan versus an HMO plan. And most people, because of obvious financial reasons, will opt to get the, le the less expensive plan available, the least expensive plan available. But very often these plans have very high deductibles. So many parents aren't even aware and they have no idea what a deductible is. So you know what happens then is insurance companies like Aetna and Blue Cross and Blue Shield and Cigna, they may withhold payment until the parents pay their deductible. And that can be a real problem for many parents. Some states have catastrophic medical coverage. In New Jersey, we have something called New Jersey CAT or New Jersey catastrophic. So if the parents have a deductible that they can't afford, they are able to apply to New Jersey catastrophic to see if they can get their deductible covered. Uh, you have to know how and when to appeal an insurance company um, rejection of payment, because very often what happens with insurance companies 
is they deny payment on multiple codes and you have to appeal and uh, fight for reimbursement when you actually did the work. Um, the, I do recommend that you continue to learn more about billing and coding, the double ANS, the AMA, and the Optum books are very, very helpful. Um, you should know what CPT, Common Procedural Terminology, stands for. Each CPT is associated with an RVU, Relative Value Unit, and that's how uh, the payers uh, decide how complicated a procedure is. The more complicated a procedure, the higher the RVU. Usually, the more that you will be getting paid for uh, the procedure. The AANS offers a coding course, which is usually a two-day course, although most recently all of these courses have been online. And um, I highly encourage all of you to uh, take a course like that every few years. Uh, the other thing that I'll tell you is every now and then, as pediatric neurosurgeons, we're asked to participate in RVU and CPT surveys that are sent out by our RUC committee and our Washington committee. You should really participate in those surveys because what they're looking at is they're, they wanna know how much work a certain surgery involves. So for example, if they ask you, how long does it take you to do your typical rhizotomy? If you say, oh, this is an easy surgery, it only takes two hours, that code will be devalued in the next rendition of payments. If you say, you know what, doing a rhizotomy typically takes me four hours in the OR, two or three hours to get the patient counseled and ready for surgery, and they're in the hospital for five to seven days afterward, this is a very complicated procedure. Well, then the RVUs associated with that procedure will go up in the future. But if you devalue your own time and the complexity of the procedure, the value and the associated RVUs goes down. So it's really important. So a shout out to uh, the RUC surveys and please participate in those surveys. So Lance, do you wanna open it up and we can do some questions now? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Obviously, um, there's a ton to cover in coding. We can't get through everything in an hour. That's why the, the coding courses exist, like Kathy said. Um, but uh, yeah, we can definitely do questions now. Lance, Kathy, and uh, I'll ask you some spine questions. I noticed that, or Kathy, on one of yours, you talked about a corpectomy. Uh, definition of a corpectomy versus ACDF and because there's a percentage of the vertebral body that must be drilled out. So billing, I believe billing an ACDF as a corpectomy will get you into trouble. Can you comment on that a little bit? So I am definitely not a pediatric spine specialist. So if you do the corpectomy without a fusion, that has a separate code. So um, I'm not exactly understanding what you're talking about. Because I think the corpectomy is a couple, it, at least in the board, and perhaps Benny can comment a little bit on this, is you, if you're going to bill a corpectomy, make sure that you're, you are drilling greater than 50% of the vertebral body out before using the, cord, the code for corpectomy. Because that, if you're, if you're doing spine, whether it be in, teenagers or young adults, you just make sure that you're truly doing a corpectomy and, and removing over 50% of the vertebral body. Correct, that is absolutely correct. So you're not just doing the discectomy. You can't bill, correct. if you do the discectomy, you can't bill for a corpectomy like by drilling out just the end plate, that's correct. So again, I to illustrate, this is very complicated and this is these, uh, you know, Lance and Kathy are very knowledgeable in this as you guys, hopefully you guys uh, was illustrated and it will be, um, this resource will be recorded and available online. Are there any further questions either in the chat or or from, from some of our more senior members to illustrate some of the things that uh, that we, we need to make sure the younger folks uh, get or have 
um, <clears throat> one of at, things, at least an awareness of. Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah. One of the things that I, I didn't mention too, you know, and I see some of the people on the call are epilepsy surgeons. Make sure for your secondary procedures, you're always adding that stage modifier. So for example, if you put grids in and then you're taking the patient back to the OR to take the grids out and do a resection, add on the stage modifier, or you might get a decreased reimbursement for the second surgery because it's within the global. And uh, John, anything you wanna talk about as far as further on epilepsy surgery and coding? Um, no, I mean, I, I, I agree with Kathy. I mean, I always, I always make sure to very clearly state that it's a planned stage two surgery for, you know, a grid resection or removal. Of course, that a lot of that paradigm has changed because now we're usually doing stereotactic EEG depth electrodes where the removal, which is the second case, is still part of the universal code for the first case. So we're not going to get, you know, any type of reimbursement for that second case. And then typically our next surgery, if it is an ablation or a resection, you know, we do specify if it's happening within the global period, because oftentimes our um, our timeline is maybe at soon as six to eight weeks after surgery. So if it falls within that three month period, we do, um, you know, make sure that we document that it is a, a stage two surgery, a planned stage two surgery for resection after, if you know, an, an invasive monitoring period. Um, the like laser ablation, um, that can be kind of difficult. Uh, there's no specific code for laser ablation. So sometimes we have to use like stereo oh. tactic. Yeah, yeah, if you want to. Turns out those are coming down the pipe now. That Good. like right, it's it's real close. Um, there's going to be a lit code for simple and complex, a so one trajectory versus multiple trajectories. So th there are actually a set of codes coming down the pipe for that. Because uh, it's been kind of, you know, it's been kind of makeshift, you know, I mean, I, I think we've gotten to, you know, we've done enough cases right now that we're in a, we're in a, we're in a routine um, of, of what we know it's a code, but initially, I was always kind of scratching my head, like, oh, are we putting like stereotactic radio surgery because it's a stereotactic approach and it is a, it's, it's sort of, I mean, it's ablating something, which is kind of like, you know, I don't know. So, um, Amar just wrote a text, the new codes for lit decrease RV by a lot. Not a good thing. So, well, so what Amar just commented on is, so that's the, that's what tends to happen. So when we don't have a specific code for something and we're trying to do fit, fit the square in the circle hole, um, it, it makes it more difficult at the time, but when we, as a specialty, try to get a new code for something, it is always devalued compared devalued. to, so, so that's the balance that um, neurosurgery as a whole weighs when trying to go for new codes or not. Yeah, I mean, I wonder how often for trajectories will end up adding complexity modifiers because so many of those trajectories require a lot of studying preoperatively to ensure the avoidance of any silical vessels. But I know what you're going to say, Lance, if you keep on doing it, you're going to incur an audit. Um, but I don't know. I mean, like for some, like, so I'll get for one of my epilepsy cases, I always add a complexity modifier. I haven't gotten in trouble yet, but for a functional hemispherotomy, I put an added complexity modifier for every one of those cases. And I mean, I, I heard what you said, if you, if you use a complexity modifier too frequently, but in my mind that, you know, that's one of the most complex cases we do in neurosurgery. It's got seven, you know, it's got like seven stages in the surgery. So I'm, I'm hoping I'm not, you know, leaving myself, um, you know, exposed for that, but for a surgery, which requires six to seven stages, I mean, hell, I, I think that's complex enough. So probably would have heard of it by, from your institution. But, by yeah. Now. But, yeah. Lance, yeah. But Lance and Jonathan, you should audit those codes. I have never, I, I use the complexity modifier very rarely, but not once in my life have I ever been paid more for using the 22 modifier. <laughs> never. So you can add it, you can add 10. 22 dash 22 they just won't pay and then the yeah. other thing john is it might not translate to your rvu total either. no i know yeah. the 22 yeah. ups the rvu our coders always i mean listen our coders reach out and they ask like you know do you want to put a yeah. complexity modifier and then they say yes i mean i i guess i haven't really paid attention to how much of it we're getting reimbursed for but i mean 63 okay. definitely it's worth a shot so I didn't ask a few more questions. Hey, Jen, anything more? Uh, Dr. Shraley, anything more? I, I know you are a complex spine person. Any more spine wisdom for, for the uh, people coming out that you could share? Um, 
No, I agree about all the, you know, separate codes for arthrodesis instrumentation, each level, um, how it was delineated previously. And then for the graft, you know, if you're going to be harvesting autograft, you can, you know, bill through, as was mentioned before, separate incision, if you're going to do iliac crest or rib graft, but you can't bill for autograft obtained through the same incision. Right. Um, I haven't okay. billed. Oh, sorry. No, you um, know what's funny, Jennifer? Like with, with the fluoroscopy codes, you know, and when I do back with pumps, I usually use a C-arm and fluoro to put the catheter tip wherever I want, C1, C4, wherever, you know, and, you know, no offense, but no radiologist ever reads those films, <laughs> ever. And you're the one in there putting on the lead, getting exposed to radiation. You're the one looking at the films and interpreting the films and reading them in your own head to make a surgical decision. So if, if there is no reading, and I check, if there is no reading, or if the radiologist is so lazy that they say, see operative report for interpretation of films, then I, I bill for it. I don't ever get paid for it, but I bill for it. I haven't billed for fluoroscopy or um, Mayfield application. Um, however, I've never built for Mayfield, but for fluoro, I feel like <laughs> we're interpreting it. If we're doing it and no one else is reading it, then you shouldn't. Uh, Lance, okay. I had one quick question. Yeah. For the me, is there any difference in endoscope assisted versus no endoscope? Uh, you, you fuzzed out a little bit there. You're talking about endoscopic cranial synestosis? Yes. So, um, so good question. And um, I was actually going back and forth with Mark Rocker a little bit just now about this. Um, there, technically the 61550 is the open single suture code. I think a lot of people straight up translate it to the endoscopic code because we're doing the same thing. Um, it sounds like some institutions use the unlisted neurosurgery code um, and have a priori agreements with their payers that they, they may get more for that. Um, however, um, I, I don't think that's a common setup. What have you been doing? You're on mute. Well, um, Matt previously did all of the cranial synestosis. So uh, now that he's transitioned to Florida, um, uh, I've been, I, I've uh, been doing a lot more cranial synestosis. That's why I was asking. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cleaner path is 61550 for the, okay. the endoscopic single suture. Um, and it would be, barring some exceptions, I think, hard to get mm. up codes on that. Okay. That was artfully said, uh, by the way. <laughs> I just right, want to add it. to... Yeah. Just, just one thing, uh, we do use the 64999 for that, but uh, one thing to add to kind of what both Lance and Kathy had said, Lance talked about in the synestosis about using the, eight, the dash A2 for the assistant. It is important to know that certain codes allow for co-surgeon and certain codes don't. So like the 61557 and, uh, um, and uh, the plastics uh, front to orbital code allow for an assistant, but not for a co-surgeon whereas the 61559 allows for co-surgery. Um, so it's important in all your codes and all your things that you're doing to know which ones are allowed and which ones aren't. And that book, um, the other company that, that Kathy alluded to does list all of those things and your coders should have that. So knowing whether you can have an assistant or you can have a co-surgeon, I think is important for when you, when you bill as well. Um, and I know at our institution, we're currently not allowed to have co-surgeons within the same department anymore. Um, and whether that works at, how that works at, at your place, even if it's something where it's maybe different areas of the surgery. So those are things to kind of think about and be aware of. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Thank you. We don't either. Like, yeah, we're, we've been told to not use co-surgeons within the same within our same division. So we just, we completely gave it up. We just do, if we're going to, if we're helping out, we just, um, we include that individual as a, as a first assistant. And then we've completely given up on co-surgeons within the same division and never, it doesn't work. And Eric looked well, like, the, Eric looked like, like the shadow man with his background. I just had, <laughs> I had to put that in Eric. I don't know what's going on with your background, but you definitely look like a man in the shadows. Uh, All right. I'm, I'm outside hey. and it's getting done. Thank you guys. Uh, Benny, any uh, last words? We've covered some very complicated topic and a lot of 
numbers thrown at people. Anything else we you you would like to talk about or things we should um, pitfalls that we should uh, cover? Uh, this was outstanding, guys. Thank you so much for doing this, uh, Jeff and Eric and um, uh, Lance and Kathy. Um, I mean, I think you've achieved what we needed to achieve. Part of the issue with the boards is uh, is uh, coding is becoming a, a very important uh, part of it. Uh, some of it, I have to say, some of the uh, issues with failure of pediatric neurosurgeons related to coding may be something like they also do some adult work and there could be some adult spine coding that could be an issue. So uh, I would just keep our, our mind open that, uh, uh, that uh, there's a lot for all of us to learn. And thank you all for doing this. This was outstanding. Hey, Jeff, we're, we're, <clears throat> this was great. Where, where does the recording get posted? Is it on the it, pediatric be, site? You know, it's on the pediatric side. It'll be there probably within the next three or four days. Great. In yeah, addition, thank you. In, in addition to the recording, are you going to put the PowerPoint on? Because I mean, Lance's yes. quick reference, we're, we're freaking all like we're awesome. So Power, PowerPoint will be there. And thank you, Brandon. Thanks. And uh, we will see you guys at our next meeting, which will which will occur next month. Thank you much. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Lance. Bye, John. <laughs>